Welcome to Beyond the Text and our special series From Academy to Arena. Join me as we explore how political ideas collide with real-world political battles. Each episode unravels the complexities of translating theory into impactful change. Get ready for a captivating journey into the pulse of political thought. This is Beyond the Text, where ideas come to life. Greetings, esteemed listeners, and welcome to the Beyond the Text series, Academy to Arena podcast. I'm your host, Samuel Woodall, and I'm thrilled to bring you a unique episode that transcends time, offering you an exclusive glimpse into a pivotal interview from my archives. In 2021, I had the privilege of sitting down with the remarkable Hilary Benn, MP, for an insightful conversation that resonates with relevance to this day. As the founder and president of a group called Progressive Britain, I embarked on a mission to explore the depths of ideas and perspectives that went beyond the text, and beyond the headlines. Today we unlock the vault and share excerpts from that captivating interview, making the wisdom of one of our era's thought leaders accessible to you. Join me as we revisit this conversation, not as a mere retrospective, but as a timeless source of inspiration. From the Academy of Ideas to the arena of politics, we bridge the gap and invite you to immerse yourself in the profound insights that have the power to shape our understanding of the world. This is the Beyond the Text series Academy to Arena podcast, where the past meets the present to chart the course for our collective future. Stay tuned for an episode that brings the past to life and sparks new perspectives for the journey ahead. So hi everyone, I'd like to welcome our first guest speaker uh, for this week, and it's yeah, the Right Honourable Mr Hilary Bent. And having a portfolio that spans seven years of being a Secretary of State under the Baron Brown Ministries and four, de- four shadow secretary positions, I don't think there's anybody who could be better to kickstart our in-discussion series. Having chaired the recently concluded cross-party Brexit committee, attendees of this discussion can expect to hear the turbulent twists and turns of recent years in British politics, its impact on the student and the citizen. And moreover, during the COVID pandemic, Mr. Ben has championed educational provision for those most in need and deserve. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Hilary Ben. <laughs> so, yeah, what do we do so online? Much. Do we grunt uh, yeah. or... Uh... <laughs> yeah, just nod. <laughs> uh, yeah, ah. Now I can see that Saviel has got it right by putting a hand up. <laughs> Saviel is our international officer, um, Batiste is our um, social secretary, um, Remy Brown is my vice president and I'm president of the society so yeah so we I suppose we can um, we can go to the questions. Okay off you go. Um, so first I'd like to talk about your beginnings so whilst growing up do you feel your family political discussions with as you quoted Brexit dinner and at uh, breakfast <laughs> dinner and everything in between <laughs> shaped who you are and what you stand for today? Yes mm. of course because we are we are all the products of our upbringing, our circumstances. Um, When you're little, you assume that all families are like your own because it's the only one you really know. And then we grow up and we discover other families and other circumstances. And the, what our parents give us, I mean, I've got four children. What is, what what are our greatest and most important responsibilities? What is our greatest responsibility as as a parent? It is to love and encourage our children. Exactly. That's it, because we all need love and encouragement. And I think my mum and my dad taught me and my two brothers and my sister, obviously, to take an interest in the world. And that's why we talked about what was going on. And, and eventually I realised what my dad did and why other people were somewhat interested in that. Um, when you're small and a, a whole load of people come into the back garden to interview him, and I believe you not believe you me in those days, if it was a TV crew, there would be a cameraman, there would be an assistant cameraman, there would be a sound engineer, there would be a producer and an assistant producer. Um, that's what staffing was like in those days. And nowadays we are likely to interview ourselves or someone will hold up an iPhone and be both cameraman, uh, sound man, because they all were all men in those days. 
Um, so that's a big uh, change that's taking place. And the most important thing I think they taught all of us is um, come to your own judgment, say what you think is right and stand up for what you believe in. Now, those I think are, I hope those are qualities that I have taken forward in my life since I was little. Certainly. And um, yeah, I think all of us as politics students can agree that we've all been shaped by our yeah. parents too, most certainly. <laughs> um, and that can include, you know, uh, taking a very different view from your parents. My, my mother was an American. She grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, her family were all staunch conservative Republicans and she wasn't. Uh, she had a very different political view that she formed herself. Um, so it doesn't mean it doesn't mean slavishly following what your parents say or think. And I think maybe one of the themes of the discussion today may be how you can hold a different view from someone else without having to uh fall out and how to respect others who hold a different view although i have to say in current uh politics and the state of society um i think we're in some trouble exactly and this is why we've started what we're trying to do because yeah. it's just so fearful that you know you can engage in a simple simple discussion around um you know around the state of europe and you, i've got lots of friends of my european colleagues and then suddenly it'll all become polarized and by the end of the evening you could not be friends so it's like what what can we do to get back to the kind of way of discussion that you had it doesn't mean that that we aren't passionate about what we feel and fundamentally disagree with people and we'll fight with every ounce of breath in our body to try and achieve an outcome so it's not about it's not about being timid um and the great thing about the democratic system is you know you count up the votes at an election you count up the votes in the house of commons you win you lose and you accept the result while fighting to try and change it next time and that is that is the fundam that is the fundamental cultural principle of democracy it is we see countries in the world where the the mechanics of democracy are apparent but there isn't the culture and that culture and former president trump completely failed to understand it that culture includes you know what sometimes you lose and accepting that and constructing and accepting that yeah and instead of what he's been doing uh, going round lying that he was defrauded of his um, his his electoral birthright and in the process severely undermining and damaging democracy because how could you operate as a democracy if the losing candidate is going to scream foul fraud yes. and I, I I watched for I hadn't watched it for years I watched Citizen Kane on Saturday night. I don't know how many of you have ever seen it, but I have, yeah. oh boy, Orson Welles, who was a genius, you thought, my God, this man knew about Trump before he even came into politics life because when he has to, he, he's, he, he's compromised and a scandal emerges, but he still stands in the election against Mr. Geddes and the front page of the newspaper he owns says election fraud. And I thought, blimey, I've, I've seen that somewhere else only recently. Have any of you seen Citizens Kane? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. You have, yeah. It's a. It was an extraordinary film because it, it was innovative in so many different ways, including, I'm told, showing ceilings. Because in all films before then, you had a set and the camera yeah. just looked straight forward. And in Citizen Kane, you've you've got the camera leaning back, and there's Orson Welles, and there's the ceiling of the room. And this was had never been done before. So you always have to judge things. Not against the standard of today, but what was the standard of the time to understand what was truly innovative? And with yeah, and with now I'm this. taking up far too much time on the first question, which is we'll never get to the end. So come on, crack on. <laughs> so the next question from your beginnings is um, well, it's actually about beginnings more generally. I, I thought I'd do it in that sense that I remember when I met you. Um, I don't know if you'd remember, um, but at 2017 conference, it was only a fleeting thing, but I was outside the main conference hall 
and I, I remember saying to you, I was one of the youngest to be a delegate. Um, I was only 16, so to be a delegate for my constituency was an honour. But I remember saying to you that at the time, I wasn't overly happy with um, the way the leadership was heading. And you told me to keep believing. So what would you say to a young person today who faces a divided political world? Well, the, the first fundamental truth, and congratulations on being a, a delegate at that uh, age, um, I think when we when we come to conference for the first time, uh, I remember uh, I remember coming to a compositing meeting, where under the old arrangements you you turn up holding your resolution from your constituency, and everyone else who had a resolution on the same subject would pile into the same room, and you could agree a composite provided you could find the words to make a composite that were contained in at least one of the resolution so sometimes you get to the point where someone say has anyone got a spare hand that we could put in <laughs> um and i thought I, I thought i had a jolly good resolution for my constituency and there were two trade union leaders who came in and just said right we're going to do this and this bish bash bosh and that was it and i left that compositing meeting uh, a lot wiser and understanding the nature of of power in organizations i think that's the first thing second fundamental truth is that most of the time in the Labour Party's history, some uh, or more Labour Party members have been unhappy about what the leadership is doing. Uh -huh. um, uh, so now why is that? Because we are a broad church. I am a passionate believer in the Labour Party as a broad church. Because if you're going to win elections, you don't do that by purifying yourself down to a narrow sect and say to the voters, Right, you've all got to think like this uh, if you're if you're going to deserve giving us your vote. No, you need to appeal broadly to people who one hopes will see politics and the right values and the right policies as a means to improving their lives and their communities, because that's why the Labour Party was founded. And there's so many examples of how the Labour Party has done it. But the third truth is that Labour Party members on the whole tend to love talking about the achievements of Labour governments gone by and they tend to talk with great anticipation about what the next Labour government will do but when they actually have a Labour government in office not all members are entirely sure that they enjoy the experience <laughs> and that's just an observation based on uh, you know reflection over many years and why is that because Labour Party members will tend to wake up in the morning conscious of the wrongs that have not yet been righted, the things that remain undone. And we must never, ever lose that aspiration to change the world for the better. But it's also really, really important to pause occasionally, like climbing up a mountain when you have to stop to get your breath back and just to turn and gaze uh, um, at the place that you have come from because that reminds you blimey look at look at what we have done so mm. far and that then fills you with encouragement to get on to the next thing and i my advice would be exactly the same as you you tell me i gave to you when we met um keep believing because the opposite of, of belief in hope and betterment is despair and cynicism and sometimes people will say to me oh mr ben i'm very very cynical and i say well that's jolly interesting but tell me what do you do with your cynicism in life do you take it to work with you in the morning do you keep it in a cupboard at home and have a conversation with it when you come back at night and the reason i make that point is that cynicism will get us nowhere cynicism has never been a motivating force uh, for good ever so criticism, doubt, all of those things, wholly proper, wholly legitimate. A good politician doubts him or herself all the time. Beware the politicians who are utterly certain. Um, but cynicism, no thanks. So I hope, I hope we can see that behind Starmer in the future as well as we move forward as a party. Um, <laughs> so my next question. Um, which we formulated from the committee is on your political career. So yes. um, the first one is in relation to obviously an important um, topic at current is um, how and why 
would you say you changed your opinion on the European community between the 1975 vote and the vote in 2016? Well, that's a really interesting uh, question. And it wasn't just it wasn't just me. It was the vast majority of Labour Party members, because mm. for those and none of you will remember this, but in 74, 75, th about two thirds of the Labour Party and the trade union movement were very opposed to membership of the common market and wanted to come out. And Wilson won the, well, became prime minister after the February 74 general election and had said, how are we going to deal with this? Because we've got a strong pro-European group where Jenkins had led the 69 Labour MPs to vote in favour of the European Communities Act in 1972, which is why it passed. And there was a lot of bitterness about that. But uh, Roy Jenkins and those who supported him were passionate believers in Europe. Ted Heath, in fairness, uh, he was a passionate European because of what he'd seen in the 1930s. He mm. had seen Hitler, he had fought Hitler, and he understood that the European Union was above all else a political means of preventing a return to fascism and conflict on the continent of Europe. Now, we always had a, a different perspective in Britain because we hadn't lived under the yoke of fascism. We were late yeah. comer. We peered over the garden fence at what the EU was up to and eventually said, can we join in? And famously, President de Gaulle said, no. And then uh, President Pompidou said, we, oui. and uh, we ended up uh, joining in 73. Now, I would argue that a decision of that magnitude should have been put to the people. And Wilson said, look, we're going to have a renegotiation and a referendum. Now, that may sound very familiar to you in the light of what happened in 2016. So it was straight out of the Wilson approach. And... Um, why were we like that? Because we made arguments about democracy, which had force then and still have force now. Um, although we can have a debate about sovereignty, uh, because the thing about if you want absolute sovereignty, don't engage with anybody else. Lock yourself in your room, as I always say. If you lock yourself in your room, you are completely sovereign. You have Isolated. complete power. <laughs> Uh, the trouble is, where does it get you? And the answer is it doesn't get you anywhere. And all human international relationships are about pooling a bit of sovereignty for, for mutual benefit. You take on obligations and you hope to gain. And that's what international alliances are all about. Secondly, concern about price rises and a fear that the Labour left argument that you could never have socialism in the United Kingdom if you're a member mm. of the European Union because the horrid treaty of Rome would prevent it happening. And we have the same arguments in 76 with the Lexiteers, the very small this. percentage of uh, Labour members who are in favour of leaving. They said, you can't nationalise the railways if you're in the European Union. To which the answer was, uh, excuse me, uh, SNCF, the French railways are nationalised and the German railways are nationalised. Could you just run it past me one more time as to why you say that we can't nationalise them? So. We lost and we were cross and we grumbled and we fought election saying we'll come out and we did very badly in uh, uh, well where we lost eventually in 79 and then 83 and 87 and then in 1988 this is the moment i would pinpoint at the tuc jacques Delors turned up the president of the commission and he in effect said brothers and sisters i lay before you a vision of a social europe and what Jacques Delors said was, you can get improvements in workers' rights and working conditions and environmental standards through the European Union. And this was at the time when Mrs. Thatcher was busy undermining workers' rights and working conditions. And the trade union movement is nothing if not pragmatic. And Ron Hot Todd, the head of the TGWU at the time, said, Europe, it's the only card game in town. And this began the change, and within about two and a bit years, the Labour Party had changed entirely and became a pro-European party. And the really interesting thing is, if you look back over those 45 years, uh, 1975, Labour riven on Europe, um, 
two to one against, Conservatives wholly pro-European. And in the intervening 45 years, vice versa, <laughs> we've ended up a mirror image of each other. The Tories riven and the Labour Party united, uh, apart from a few uh, Lexiteers. So, um, and th that's what happened. And if you look at the great challenges of today, climate change, let's just take one climate change. I, I saw with my own eyes leading the British delegation to the Bali climate change talks in 2007, just how important it was for the European Union to turn up as a block and say, OK, folks, this is what we're prepared to do to tackle climate change. How much are you in for? Uh, and that's the point I was making about alliances. So it was a long and it was a slow process. Uh, but that is not to say that in campaigning for Remain in 2016, I did so because I think the European Union is perfect. It is not. It is far no. from perfect. And it does lack democracy in certain respects. But you weigh up the, the good and the bad. And there was no doubt in my mind that the benefits of remaining hugely outweighed the uh, damage of leaving. Okay. But the referendum was a first example. and. I suppose uh, you could argue Scottish independence would be a second example where the economic argument, I'm afraid, is an also ran to emotion and identity. And, and I would say it. that, uh, and this is just with one other point, is that in that referendum in 2016, if you, if you talk to a lot of my constituents and said to them, do you feel you have any control over the way in which the world has changed, your life has changed, your community has changed. Quite a lot of them would say, no, I don't. Mm. And so when someone comes along and says, would you like a bit more control? Would you like to take back yeah. control? Don't be surprised if they jump at the chance. And the proof of that was seen in the significant number of people who'd never voted in a general election before, uh, which anticipates what may be your next question about turnout, mm. um, came out and voted in that referendum because they saw a proposition where they felt if we win this, something is definitely going to change. And, and uh, so it proved. Exactly. And I mean, we're obviously us being based in the Southwest, there was a massive vote to vote to leave. And um, and it's it seems to be much more an, an idealist thing, a sort of, you know, uh, this idea that we can bring back, you know, what, what we had, but the, it's not a material class-based thing. It's, it seems to be particularly down here, across kind of cross culture, cross class, based sort of vision of the ideal of the past, I suppose. Yes, I, I, I think mm. because if look, if you live in a community where there used to be the mines, the steel mills, the textile factories, manufacturing, shipbuilding, and all of that has gone and it's been replaced by zero hours contract jobs, you have to do two jobs mm. to feed a family, whereas in the old days, one person could work and get a good wage, or it's warehouse work. Don't be surprised if they say, I don't think my community has changed for the better. Now, was that the fault of the European Union? Uh, no, but that period of decline coincided with membership. And I remember having a vigorous argument with someone who said, well, it is the fault of the European Union. Now, it's a product of globalization. And in the recent pandemic, we've come to see and understand better some of the limits of that. Because if you're wholly dependent on supplies from the other side of the world to keep your doctors and your nurses safe in hospital when you have an epidemic, as we were, uh, it ought to cause you to think about what is the right balance between outsource capacity and having capacity yourselves to produce what is required. And the vaccines and the Oxford AstraZeneca in particular, I think is a really good example of that. Yeah, to, say, to stay self-sufficient, but I suppose we'll have to see. Yeah, not wholly. I, I'm no, not no. an island fortress economy, <laughs> but I'm making a point uh, about balance. And I think so many of the things that we are discussing is about getting the balance right. Because as climate change demonstrates, it only takes a little change a slight increase in temperature. People may say an extra half a degree, one degree. Well, what's the problem? It's a nicer sunny day. You go talk to uh, scientists who will say, well, at that one degree, uh, the pest and disease that at the moment is kept in check, 
wins out over trees and spe and plants and species and then you've got a whole other problem from a very because the balance ecological forces held in balance has been changed and the same is true in politics in my view uh, fantastic thank you and um yeah so the second question of your political career yeah. um is as you pointed out is on turnout and um yeah. when you won your first um seat at the general election turnout was at 19.6 percent do you yep. feel that in a democracy a lack of participation is a concern for all of us and yes. if so what changes can the sort of center whether that's the our sort of center left or the liberals or conservatives what can the center do through education to get people engaged well this is a very uh, interesting and important question now in just in my defense uh the my by election was held on the day of the European elections when loads of people didn't vote anyway. And uh, it was the it was not the lowest by election turnout ever, because in the Second World War, there was a turnout of just over nine percent in London. But it was the lowest turnout in a, in a non wartime. Uh, by election for Parliament until my good friend and colleague Lucy Powell was elected in Manchester Central and I sent her a text saying dear Lucy many congratulations and thank you so much for removing me from the footnote of shame for the lowest <laughs> turnout in a parliamentary by-election and she took it in extremely good grace I was um, I was really I'll be honest I was quite shocked that it was yeah. that bad um, and of course you 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 take it a uh, personally and I said at the count you know this is not good for democracy um, now why was that the case by elections tend to have lower turnouts and there are other factors but ultimately people come out and vote if they think they've got a stake in society and they see politics as a means to deal with the problems around us to Im improve our lives and it is no accident that the highest turnout you will find in the leafiest most prosperous places in the country and the lowest turnout in the poorest places in the country with high turnover. It's absolutely no accident at all, because I have many constituents who, if you when you talk to them, don't feel that politics has anything to do with their lives at all. People will say, what's the point in voting? Yeah. They never what's it going to do for me? Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. And um, nothing ever changes. Now, as I get older, I get slightly more politely militant when someone says that to me. And I remember talking to a young woman on a doorstep in Barnsley during Dan Jarvis's by-election. And she said, she said to be perfectly honest, and I'm a bit ashamed to say, I've never ever voted and I don't really understand this politics business. What's it all about? And so I had a conversation with her. And as I was looking around, I noticed just up the hill was a sign um, saying you know sure start center here and i said well take an example that sure start center up there wh where do you think that came from yeah. and the answer is it came from politics because labor stood on a manifesto in 97 we with a lot of commitments one of which was to establish a network of sure start centers um and these things don't fall out of the sky they're not uh, suddenly delivered one day out of the kindness of someone's heart. They are a struggle. Um, but boy, is it worth it. And we are at the moment regularly applauding um, the greatest achievement of politics and political values in our country, courtesy of the Labour government of 1945 to 51. And that is the establishment of the National Health Service. Nice. Now, if that doesn't demonstrate the astonishing power of values and politics and participation to radically change people's lives for the better, and it's it's probably even more popular now than it was when it was uh, established by Nye Bevan. And what made it happen? In the end, millions and millions of people taking a pencil and putting a cross on a piece of paper. And that's how we created the National Health Service. And that is the argument for participation in the political process.
do you think there's something we could do through educate because i mean i i try to work it out as you say sort of like you know the, the poorest the people who deserve to have this change the most as you say are the ones who often feel ambivalent towards it and i wonder if it's something through education through schools through citizenship is that something we can do to kind of empower them to well, I think it is. I think it is all uh, all of those things. I think it's really important that in schools we educate the next generation about how our democracy works. It strikes me as extraordinary that we don't do that, um, and we should because these are tools that we need in our lives. Um, you know, there's dog mess in the kids' playground. The traffic's going too fast. I can't get my kids into. A decent school. I'm living in an overcrowded house. I object to American foreign policy. I don't like the arrest of Mr. Navalny in Russia. You name it, whatever the issue is, how can you do something about it? And the answer is by getting involved. Now, not everyone wants to be a politician. Uh, not everyone wants to be a member of a political party. But uh, politicians do pay attention to what their constituents are saying. Uh, to them. Now, there may be times when, regardless of what they say, I will say, well, uh, I hear what you say, but I'm afraid I fundamentally disagree. We are not, we are not delegates, we are representatives. Yeah. And that's, I think that's really important. Well, that's my view, uh, to understand that. And if you really don't like, I often say to people, if you don't like what I'm doing and how I'm voting, then kick me out of the next election. And you'll, uh, you'll have no complaint from me, from me, because that is, um, Democracy. That, is democracy. that really is uh, <laughs> democracy. Um, so education, but not to, you know, we, we can't moralize or wag our finger at people. Uh, they have to be able to see that for themselves. We are also to blame is the other reason. Um, because if we over promise, then what is that followed by disappointment? And I think the if you like the cycle of wild promises, disappointment, another lot of wild promises, disappointment. It, sorry, it's not very healthy. And, you know, the old story in life under under promise and over deliver. That's a much better way of building people's confidence. And, and, and then lastly, enabling people to see what they have been able to do for themselves. And that is where devolution of power, responsibility and funding it's important because you can have a political system when you're always asking someone else up the line to do something for you. Whereas if you're given some responsibility as a community uh, or an organization and the means to do something about it, then you're suddenly faced with choices, priorities. And, and I learned that see. from my time as a school governor, because when I first became a school governor, all the decisions about staffing, the building and so on were taken by the council. By the time I left being a school governor, we had devolved budgets. We took the decisions. And you, you understood how hard it was for the council, but you did have some ability to decide priorities. Uh, and that's why I, I'm a supporter of uh, devolution of power. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. So uh, the um, actually there is a question on devolution, but I think my vice president wants to ask it at the end okay. about sort of like the the state of the union in general. Um, but yeah, so when you became secretary of state in two thousand and three, how did you pragmatically prepare for the global crises you faced? And can you give some insight into how to constructively work together with global partners to deal with crises rather than resort to the nativism we see today? Well, nothing quite prepares you for being uh, a minister firstly, and then a, a secretary of state. Um, it, it depends. If you've shattered it in opposition, you tend to come into the department with a, a program, a view. Uh, whereas in government, you, I was, uh, I was uh, the minister for prisons and probation, and then I went back to DFID to become the Minister of State because Claire Short had resigned and Valerie Amos became the Secretary of State but she was in the House of Lords and then six months later I became the Secretary of State. And when new ministers, new Secretaries of State arrive in departments, the entire world that is interested in the work of that department looks with eager anticipation 
uh, the new person and thinks, well, what is, what is he or she going to do? What do you think? What, what are your views? Where are you going to suggest we go? My dad always used to joke. He said the civil servants would sometimes say, Minister, we only wish to know which way your mind is moving. And he would uh, say in jest, if only they knew that my mind was completely stationary because <laughs> you're still working it out for yourself. And when I went to DFID originally as a junior minister for a, nearly a year and then came back, I will freely confess I realized how ignorant I was about so many things. And I mean ignorant in the true sense of the word. There'll be Latin scholars, I'm sure. I do not know. And I learned. And you you find yourself in, in situations, you have decisions you have to take, policies you need to develop, and you learn and you form a view and then that motivates you. And that's why I'm in favor of ministers having a, a, a good period of time in a department to be able to make things happen because otherwise the civil service runs the country because the civil service, bless them, and they're wonderful. I work with fantastic committed uh, civil servants, but all departments have a world view, let's be mm -hmm. honest. And if there's a new minister every year, well, the civil servants run the show. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, oh, there's so many things uh, to talk about. One priority was getting the UK aid budget up, which uh, we did. That Labour government uh, became the first government in British history to commit to a date to achieve the 0.7% target, which, of course, um, uh, was achieved. And all credit to David Cameron for doing that, for putting the legislation on the statute book. And lo and behold, Boris Johnson yes. and Dominic Raab have decided to cut it from 0.7 to 0.5. And I mean, of all the promises that we have, as a country have made to all of the people in the world to betray the promise you made to the very, very poorest people is in my view, so. unforgivable. Absolutely okay. unforgivable. But that involved uh, debt relief, that involved working to persuade other countries. And I suppose the, the apogee of this was the um, G8 in Glen Eagles in 2005, and there was a great movement. And we did get real commitments, and that was down to Gordon Brown and Tony Blair, uh, with a bit of help from me and, and, and others and a lot of campaigners. Um, now, not every country that made promises kept them, uh, but we certainly did. Mm. We kept our promises. So that was one thing. Take something completely different, uh, the, the tsunami in 2004. Um, I had a number of, uh, of disasters, humanitarian, resulting from conflict that I had to, to deal with. This was a natural disaster of extraordinary proportions. A quarter of a million people were killed in a very short space of time as the waters rose and they drowned. And in those circumstances, the question is a very practical one. In, in some ways, disasters um, clarify what's needed. P those who've survived have lost their homes. So they need food. They need shelter. They need water. They need education. They need health care. And to see the world gearing up to try and uh, provide that. Oh, hello. Joined <laughs> by someone. My, my vice president, um, his computer died, so he's. he's I, I thought you were <laughs> <laughs> <Apologies. laughs> magically walked walked through a wall to come and sit next to Sandra, but there we are. Um, and I found myself eleven days after the tsunami struck on an RAF plane heading for Aceh in Indonesia, taking some uh, relief supplies that the UN needed that we picked up in Denmark en route where they were kept in a warehouse. Uh, and that's a day I will never ever forget because you don't want to get in the way, you know, with a disaster. Um, if you turn up straight away, people are busy.
if you don't really know what it is you're looking at because you can't imagine what was here before the tsunami and then i started looking at the ground and i noticed that the tarmac of the road had been peeled off like a piece of icing on a cake and tossed 40 yards in that direction and then i looked further and i saw four sets of metal reinforcing rods that were on their side at which point i realized there'd been a building here and the tsunami had come in and had literally stripped the building off the reinforcing rod, rods and flattened them and what that really brought hope to me was the sheer power and force of that torrent as water as it came in um, now just a sort of coda to this one of the things i did as the international development secretary based on this and other experiences was this i reflected that when disasters strike the un um tends to appeal for money to respond and i thought this really doesn't make any sense it's like there being a fire in your accommodation today you ring up the fire brigade in exeter and so there's a fire and they say okay we'll be there as soon as we can they put down the phone and they then have to issue an appeal can anyone contribute some money for ladders will anyone buy the diesel to put in the petrol uh, the tank of the fire engine anyone got any hoses can anyone sell us some water and i thought this is ridiculous because the un ought to have a, a standing capacity so yeah. i proposed the establishment of an emergency relief fund that the un could draw on in the first instance to buy the tents the water the medical kits uh work with voluntary organizations to provide education and other things uh and it became known as the surf the common emergency response fund i went to new york to the UN, uh, I proposed that it be established. Britain was the largest initial contributor and uh, there, was there was sufficient support to make this happen. So it's an example of what I was trying to describe earlier. I took my experience of working with different disasters, saw what worked really well, saw what didn't work quite so well and proposed a change that I thought would make uh, the humanitarian system work better. And so I look back on that as uh, something that I I did, which I'm, yeah, I'm proud of doing that, um, because that's part of what you are able to do when you're in a position like that. And a, and a bit like the way you 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 spoke about your change of mind from the the vote in 1975 to 2016. I suppose that is the spirit of prudence and pragmatism. That when you gain construct constructively more knowledge, that that is the whole essence. But sure. What, what did Cain say famously when the facts change I change my mind what do you do <laughs> and I think that that sums it up because there's no good hanging on to a view in the face of the evidence unless although I'm now going to argue against myself <laughs> if, if you were able to produce evidence that showed that capital punishment significantly reduced the murder rate I would never ever vote to bring it back because um there are other considerations yeah. and for me on that issue there is a moral consideration so that's that's politics people have and that's life that's human beings we have a, a whole range of views we can be persuaded here we have some absolute principles here on which we will not compromise oh fantastic well thank you so much we'll go on to the next question which okay. uh, is an exemplification of your um your just your, how renowned you are across the house. I mean, um, applause from both sides of the chamber is not usually deemed acceptable, I was reading, but um, do you think your address to the house on such a, you know, a emotive issue as airstrikes in the Syrian crisis are an exemplification of cross-party unity in times of political uncertainty and global instability? Hmm, well, um, look, airstrikes, against Daesh. I always have to point this out. People say you voted to bomb Syria. Uh, no, I voted in favor of airstrikes targeted at the fascist mm. uh, genocidaire, otherwise known as Daesh uh, or ISIS, given what we know they had done. Now, it was a slightly unusual situation because I was the Labour Shadow Foreign Secretary. Mm. I held a diametrically opposed view to that of Jeremy Corbyn, Corbyn the leader of the Labour Party. The Labour Party didn't have a whip in that vote. Mm. Um, so members were free to vote the way they thought was right. But it was, I think, 
almost unheard of to have, well, I think unheard of to have the shadow foreign secretary standing up at the end of a debate to argue counter to what the leader of the party had argued at the beginning of the debate. Uh, and um, yeah, I was not a popular person with the Labour Party members who were passionately opposed to taking part in airstrikes against Daesh. Uh, and when I say I was not very popular, that is a bit of an understatement. Uh, but I'd thought long and hard about it. And I, I, it's all set out in the speech. But I came to the view, uh, these people are fascists. We know what they're doing. We're yeah. being asked for assistance. We're already taking action against them in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, we are flying um, oversight missions uh, in Syria, but we're currently not authorized to fire at anything. Um, so in, in one sense, militarily, it was quite a small change uh, in respect of what is was at that time a wholly porous border, because Daesh had, well, it was almost at the gates of Baghdad. Exactly. It was a very serious crisis. Um, but if you're asked for help in those circumstances, you either say, yep, we should do our bit, or you say, I'm really, really sorry about this, but it's not my problem. I hope it all turns out okay for you. I'm off to look in the other direction. Yeah. And I thought that that was just not, uh, was not a position that I could justify or explain. And I respect hugely those who are pacifists, but I am not a pacifist. Um, and in the end, action on the ground and action from the air defeated ISIS, Daesh on the ground in Syria and Iraq, but it has not yet defeated the ideology. And that is a whole other a whole other question. Um, I hadn't quite expected that the response to the speech would be the way that it was, but uh, there you are. And I, the, the final thing I would say is that people sometimes say it must have been really, well, it was difficult in some respects, yes, but when you know what it is that you think and believe and you've got an argument to make, actually that's a lot less difficult than when you're having to make an argument as a front bencher that you're not wholly committed to. Because in a political party, you are a coalition. Yeah. And sometimes you're on the losing argument in a cabinet or a shadow cabinet, uh, but collective responsibility is the basis on which the system works. And I'd call that pretty stressful if you really don't agree with it. Uh, standing up and saying what you think uh, and what you believe, no. That is that is not so difficult, and you have to live with the consequences. So, after the atrocities at the Bataclan, I think like who could turn away from what had been said? Well, there were quite a few people who. But there, I mean, there were lots of arguments. Um, in the end, the House of Commons decided. Well, thank you, and um, yeah, we'll go on to the next one, which is again about sort of. The idea of consensus politics across the chamber and um, your chairmanship of the Brexit committee showed prudent politics and consensus building working with Oliver Letwin and Yvette Cooper on an extension and then your own Ben Act itself. Um, do you feel that the cross party committee achieved what it set out and is there hope for more consensus building in the future even though I know it has now been um, abruptly well obviously with its year contract terminated when we've just got yeah. that we need to scrutinise. <laughs> Well, I must confess that the Brexit Select Committee was not the greatest example of consensus building, not for the want of trying, because, as you know, the British Select Committee system works very much on the basis you seek consensus across the members from different political parties. And by and large, the vast majority of Select Committee reports are agreed by consensus. I'm afraid that was not the case with the committee that I chaired, because the members felt passionately about Brexit, for and against, and it wasn't always possible to reach an agreement on what to say. Well, we could have reached an agreement by saying very little. And I thought, um, there's not much point in doing that. So um, one of our recommendations famously was, we said that a no deal Brexit cannot be the policy of any responsible government. Well, that was not a view shared by all members of the committee. Um, so a number of our recommendations were by majority vote and you 
I'm telling no tales because you can read it all in the minutes of the reports where you see which amendments were voted on and what the majority was for them, if they were carried. <clears throat> um, so it was, it was difficult on occasion, uh, I have to say. In the House of Commons, things changed uh, dramatically after the 2017 election when Mrs May, from her point of view, rather carelessly lost her majority. And we had this extraordinary period of two and a half years when the government was not in control. Mm. Now, generally speaking, uh, that doesn't happen because of our electoral system. You have to go back to, well, there was a formal, of course, coalition post 2010. So there was a government in control. It had a majority. You have to go back to 74 to 79 when Labour scraped in in the October with a majority of, what was it? four or five and that gradually eroded lib leb packed and so on and eventually we lost the vote of confidence by one in 79 which triggered the election then and mrs thatcher was elected um and it was extraordinary because the government didn't bring anything of any import to parliament aside from brexit because he had no confidence it would get through and on brexit the real problem for theresa may was that MPs who had voted and campaigned passionately for Brexit were not prepared to vote to give effect to it. Because, now, okay, we as the opposition, we voted down her deals for reasons that we made clear. Mm. And we got a lot of opprobrium and criticism for doing that. But if Boris Johnson and Ian Duncan Smith and others had voted for her deal first time or second time or third time, then Brexit would have happened on that basis. Uh, and it did eventually happen in respect of the withdrawal agreement because Tory MPs who were unhappy about lots of things to do with Brexit because they, I don't think they'd really faced up to what it meant in practice. Too many people believed you can leave and keep all the benefits. I mean, really, look, look what's happened in the first month. Talk to the fishermen, talk to the fashion industry. Northern Ireland as you and look at Northern Ireland. I, I remember you being one of the only people who raised Gibraltar as an issue. That's one thing I can remember from conference that you were one of the only people I could see mentioned. Well, Gibraltar, at least there is a political agreement, which they now have to turn into a treaty. And uh, I mean, the, the Spanish government's been very pragmatic in negotiating uh, that with the UK. Um, so the one thing that we did work very closely with people on other, uh, the other side of the house was preventing a no deal Brexit. And that was the origin of the Cooper Act as it became known and the Ben Act. Because I, I worked with Oliver Letwin and Dominic Grieve and Philip Hammond in the end and others. And we were a grouping who had very, very different views on how, about how the Brexit story should end. Oliver Letton would, would say, the moment any deal comes into view, I'm voting for it. Yeah. But the one thing we agreed on is we were not going to allow any prime minister to take us out with no agreement, i.e. a no deal Brexit. And that formed a majority, which then resulted in those two acts are passing. Now, I don't think Theresa May would ever in practice have taken us out without a deal. I wish I could say that of Boris Johnson, but I can't. Although, if you think back to Christmas Eve last year, in the end, I think Boris Johnson, for all his bluster and threats, even he realised he couldn't impose a no deal Brexit on yeah. the economy, especially we're in the middle of the worst economic crisis for 300 years anyway. Yeah. And you're in the uh, in the southwest of the country. You know, how would you explain to beef and lamb farmers tariffs of the order that they would have faced if there had been no trading cooperation agreement. Well, yeah. you couldn't because they'd have been going out of business. And there's enough people going out of business anyway, because Boris Johnson, for all his claims to want to get rid of red tape, has just in dumped the biggest load of red tape bureaucracy and cost on British business in history. And he's just concluded the first trade deal in history where we have made trade with our biggest trading partner more difficult. It's completely unique. And even to anyway, you're 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 getting me worked up on the subject. <laughs> um, but I'm sure we should move on to other things. Yes. Well, we can go on to current right. affairs. Okay. Um, 
Um, so the first one on that respect is um, I was watching it live and um, when you raise the distribution of laptops to children for educational purposes in the chamber on the 6th of January, do you feel that the government have gone far enough and was there a lack of logistical planning over the Christmas recess, it seems to, it seems to me at least? I don't think the government had, had fully thought this through because if you're going to close the schools and they should be the last thing to close and the first things to reopen uh, in the pandemic because education is so important to our life chances, uh, particularly children who come from the most disadvantaged backgrounds because uh, going to school opens a window on the world and gives us self-confidence and aspiration. That along with the love and support of our parents. Those are the the two most important things and it's a practical point um, I, I had a head teacher in my constituency contact me and say the dfe has has cut the number of laptops they're going to give us so i asked a parliamentary question and lo and behold the government announced that they were going to restore the number that she'd asked for but i have many constituents who live on low incomes the children the family may not have a laptop and even if they've got a laptop um they may have no broadband and they may not be able to afford the broadband and they won't be able to afford the 4G uh, charges for their children to be logging on and doing their schoolwork every day. So it's no good talking about uh, providing online learning when a section of the pupil population simply cannot take part. Um, and therefore, the government's responsibility is to make sure that they can in exactly the same way it's the government's responsibility to make sure the children don't go hungry hence the row about free school meals and holidays and the current row about the 20 pound increase in universal credit which we're fighting very hard to get the government to make uh, permanent in the current crisis they've yet to give that commitment but for many of my constituents that's the difference between having enough food to eat and not and you look at food bank usage i look at the number of food banks in leeds you know we are the sixth richest country in the world in the 21st century and last year a million people went up to a complete stranger to say i know we've never met but could you help me out because i can't feed my family this weekend and there is something fundamentally wrong it's a disgrace about our society that that happens because when i was growing up uh, there weren't food banks in that way and we need to do something um, about it so all of that pressure i think has had an impact although i don't think that there is yet a comprehensive scheme to ensure access to uh, 4g or broadband uh, but the number of laptops being distributed is increasing um, and that was a question i raised with him because it was a problem, like lots of MPs, I could see in my constituency, and my job is to raise that with ministers, in this case, the Prime Minister. Oh, well, no, I mean, it was, yeah, I mean, it's an absolute, absolute disgrace, because I mean, I think it was in the New Statesman where it said that the, with being out of school, the richest to poorest dichotomy is by, I think, edu in terms of learning is about a multiplier of three, I think, difference between the poorest and richest, and yep. that's happening day on day, then it's a, and it's really hard you you're living in overcrowded accommodation a child doesn't have somewhere doesn't certainly hasn't got a room to sit quietly to do their homework or to to listen to the lessons online because they're competing with maybe younger children i mean it's uh, this is really hard uh, it's also been hard for a lot of people who are working from home uh who who find the same thing particularly if you've got two people in the household or more and anticipating what um, you might be coming on to, the impact of all of this on students, which is another group, as we touched on at the beginning, who have had their education very significantly disrupted for very understandable reasons, because I must say, um, uh, when people write to me and say, lockdowns, they don't work. Uh, I'm sorry, they do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they do. Yeah. Now, they come at a great cost for the economy, for people's uh, mental health, isolation, income. Uh, but how do you balance that against 100,000 people dying and preventing more people from dying? 
yeah so i mean would you like to ask the next question yeah. number two i'm going to just refill my water so if yeah, you guys yeah sure <laughs> so um just linking back um to the former question do you feel that students of all ages have almost been left behind during the pandemic from your days as secretary of state for the environment and rural affairs and having to have dealt with pandemics um health and environment um do you think um, things could have been done differently around this time to prevent that? Oh, well, clearly a lot of things could have been done differently. Um, I mean, I was part of a cabinet committee in 2009 that yeah. was preparing for human pandemic flu. And we debated whether to pre-order vaccines at the time. Oh. Um, and I remember saying at one of the meetings, look, it's a lot of money. But if we don't pre-order vaccines, and it arrives and we haven't got any uh, who's going to stand up and explain why we didn't okay. so we spent a lot of money on that and on antivirals i think one of the problems the uk had is our our plan was based on a human pandemic flu model rather than what we have been dealing with in the form of coronavirus and it's very striking that if you look at the Southeast Asian countries from Vietnam to Australia, New Zealand, when this struck, they thought, ah, yeah. MERS, SARS, because they'd had that experience. Now, MERS and SARS had fatality rates of, you know, 30, 50 percent. Now, mercifully, a relatively small number of people because they got on top of it and they shut down straight away, including the borders. Now, here we are a year in. Uh, Keir Starmer yesterday saying to the Prime Minister, so where is your practical plan to make sure that everyone who comes into the country has to uh, self-isolate in a hotel? Now, there are huge economic consequences to that. And uh, so I think that was part of the reason for reluctance to take the steps that ultimately proved to be necessary. And the second was the view 11 years ago was you could shut the borders but it'll arrive anyway yeah. and it will delay it for maybe four or five weeks and i also remember saying at a meeting yeah but if it delays it for five weeks that's five weeks nearer to finding a vaccine yeah. is that not beneficial in itself and if the french close their borders believe you me the papers the next day in britain will be saying the french have closed their borders why haven't you closed your borders here so um it was very scary i have to say this uh this uh, experience on that cabinet committee as you, you because in human pandemic flu you could be looking at much higher death rates and of course the experience from spanish flu it killed people of all ages people of your age yeah yeah and the one mercy of coronavirus is it doesn't kill young people mm. now uh um, because I think that would be, well, it's difficult enough as it is. Uh, obviously, the older we get, the greater the risk. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind the government was slow to uh, lock down originally. I think that's self-evidently the case. You, I think, could argue there have been two further occasions when they've been slow to lock down. Um, but when you do lock down, you do begin to flatten the curve and send it back down the other side. Uh, the new variants are really worrying. Uh, greater transmissibility. Uh, the real fear, of course, is a variant will appear that uh, isn't Resist. immune to what the vaccines give us. That's the terrifying thing. Imagine if we were sitting here now with no vaccines, yeah. none. Yeah. What would we do? Um, but I have to say, on the other hand, in fairness, the vaccination programme has been absolutely spectacularly successful. And I, I pay tribute to all the people in the NHS. And I have to absolutely acknowledge what the government did to buy so many vaccines in advance. Yeah. You know, all credit to them for doing what I, what I suppose we did in our cabinet committee all those years ago. Um, uh, and that has put us in a position to be able to get on with it. But seeing the vaccination process, it's very, very impressive. This is the NHS at its best. Now for students, it's been difficult as it's been for everyone and there's been stop start there are the problems of uh, rent and accommodation mm. because if you're paying rent for somewhere you can't even go at the moment 
well, that seems a bit unfair. Some universities have offered some partial remedy, but the non-university accommodation providers, in my experience, despite my and other MPs' best efforts, basically say, terribly sorry, but you signed a contract for a year. Yes. Um, and anyway, I need your income to pay the mortgage, which enabled me to buy the property in the first place. So as you go down the chain, you see other people who are affected, those who own uh, shops in the center of Leeds, not getting the rent. No. Um, now, how are they managing? Because they may have borrowed to do that. It's affecting the value of pension funds. We have a very interdependent uh, economic ecology in our country. And once things begin not to work, the uh, effect is enormous. Um, people argue I'm not getting the university experience, so why am I paying the full fees? Uh, people are worried that they won't uh, experience no detriment in terms of their grades and their examinations, and there's a, a big debate about that. And isolation is very difficult for people, and the, the impact on mental health uh, is very, very considerable. And many, many students in my constituency have been in contact with me about all of those things. Ask you a question since you've raised this. Um, what has your experience of online learning and teaching been like? Um, I mean, I, I don't know if any of my anyone want to raise that. Anyone want to? I'm happy to unmute. offer an opinion. Uh, Baron, do you want to? Oh, there we go. Yeah, I've, I've really <laughs> that. I Hi. mean, I, I um, so I had a pretty stressful first term. I ended up taking, I think, a month out for um like hospital reasons and um yeah. coming back to online learning so i started the term a full month late and um it was a nightmare no no face to face especially for politics i would say the history because i do history and politics the history side of it was quite great pre-recorded lectures small seminars politics is big 20 30 people seminars and i feel like they give you two a week instead of one a week which history did and the two politics ones a week i feel like nothing goes in in either of them, whereas at least the history, it's once a week, but I feel like I do learn something out of it. Well, you, you're getting too much teaching. No, no um, so two lectures a week, but because they're so unpersonal right. and large groups of people, I feel like I'm not learning anything from two sessions for politics, whereas for the one session I get for history a week, it does, I feel like that, that, that's been dealt with quite well. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you for Thank you for letting me know. On the whole, not, not amazing. Though. Not amazing. Anybody else? Does anyone have a contrary view? Think it's been not bad given the circumstances? I'm not trying to lead anyone. I'm just trying to get a, a sense of where the balance of opinion is. Well, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a historian and, um, and along with politics, just like Barron. And yeah, I mean, I, I feel that we're lucky, I suppose, in some respects for research. And we're twinned with Falmouth as well. And a lot of their, a lot of their um, university um, a lot of their university sort of courses are much more practical and i suppose if you can't go in to do things like music dance that's surely a um you know that's surely a real disappointment oh i'll see if uh, now someone said i have a contrary view let me go and see if i can unmute okay, i'm trying to find very uh, there we are you can there we are uh hi sir yes yeah, so um i believe at least for i can't speak on behalf of people who take different courses, but I study geography uh -huh. and um, our college has spent a lot of money and a lot of time invested in ensuring that the content is, is pre-prepared and um, to a, a certain standard. And what that means is that for um, students in our cohort, people who are more flexible people are, have the ability to be more flexible and manage their own time 
and take initiative of their learning. But for people who are more dependent on the university, I speak as a mature student, by the way, right. people who are more dependent on the university suffered more. And I've seen both sides, um, but at least for our college, they, they I can certainly say that, they, that they've done a very good job at ensuring the standard hasn't fallen. And all the learning is there. And when it, when it does exist in a face-to-face -face format, albeit online, um, it's very interactive. So they haven't just whacked it up online. They've, they've taken into account the literature that suggests that people absorb more when they're, when they're engaged. And so there's a lot of interactive content. And where I have suffered is that there's been too much work because we, we've lost control. We've lost access to all the field trips and everything. So it means we're, we've, we're being set so much formative work and that means, and, and obviously we're working from home, so we don't, it's difficult to manage our time. I mean, I've been working to 8, 9 p.m. every single day. Um, that's obviously my choice and I can cope with that. But that's what, that's what my independent learning and that's what me taking initiative of my learning looks like at the moment. Whereas before I was able to just turn up to the lectures and arguably achieve the same standard. Um, so... A bit of a mixture of opinions for me there. I, I okay. do think it's good, but um, you know, I can see how it can be be um, difficult for some. Well, thank you, thank you, too, for, for for telling me that. That is that is really interesting. Look, it's been difficult for everybody. Let's be frank, the universities included. Right, Brilliant. onward. Okay. Um, oh. uh, still. still. Sorry, there was a little bit of a technical glitch there. Can you still hear us? I can hear you. Yeah. Perfect. Now. <laughs> we were slightly worried then. Um, do you want to do question three? Uh, in relation to your comment on the shortfall of Northern Ireland food supply on the 13th of January in the, in the House, um, under the trade agreement, do you feel the government has failed on their promise to the whole of the union and with nobody discussing the trade agreement since the termination of your committee on the 16th? What can be done to scrutinise the future of the deal? Um, I mean, we've seen in recent days as well, since I wrote wrote the question with sort of like graffiti happening in Northern Ireland already, sort of like yeah. what, what, what is the future of, um, of, of the agreement in that respect? Oh, well, oh, where to start with this? Um, right. Uh, the one thing that everybody involved in the Brexit argument agreed on, the UK, Northern Ireland, the Republic, the EU, was that under no circumstances could there be a return to a hard border. And therefore, the moment Theresa May announced, and this a lot of the problems that we've seen since date back to this moment, when she said, we are leaving the single market and the customs union, you had a problem. Yeah. You had a problem for this reason. Uh, the UK leaves, we become a third country. The EU applies checks to goods coming in from third countries to make sure that they comply with EU standards. If you're not going to have a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, question, where are you good, going to do the checks on goods that, are, that may move across those 280 roads from the north to the south? And there were two ways of doing it. One way which is what Mrs. May proposed, was sort of to leave the United Kingdom in elements of the um, single market and sort of the customs union, the, the Chequers compromise, so that you could say to the EU, look, you can have confidence that we're still producing goods to the same standard, therefore there's no need for any checks. And that, of course, was... Uh, anathema to the Brexiteers and Boris Johnson famous in Ireland and said no Conservative Prime Minister would ever agree to a border down the Irish Sea because the other way of doing it is to check the goods when they move from GB to Northern Ireland by having in effect a border in the Irish Sea. Now having made that promise Boris Johnson became Prime Minister didn't like what Mrs. May had proposed and promptly agreed to a border down the Irish Sea. Which is why the DUP was so angry with him, because he did what he promised he wouldn't do. Moral, um, 
I wouldn't take everything that the current prime minister says at face value. Gospel. <laughs> um, so, the technically goods moving from GB to Northern Ireland need to be checked as if they were moving from Dover to Calais. Mm. Um, and this is part of the withdrawal agreement. Now, the withdrawal agreement said, look, uh, what we need to decide is which of those goods moving from GB to Northern Ireland are at risk of entering the Republic of Ireland. Uh, this was a very important point because that's unlike Dover Calais. By definition, goods leaving Dover are all going to be entering the European Union. But all goods moving from GB to Northern Ireland are not necessarily going to end up in the European Union. So the job that the Joint Committee, on which Michael Gove and Maros Sefcovic sit, was to try and work out how do you do this. Now, the EU's opening position was all goods are at risk unless you can show me that they're not. And the e UK's opening uh, gambit was to say none of them are at risk unless you can prove that they are. <laughs> OK, and they sort of sort of met in the middle by these grace periods. So Michael Gove came to Parliament and said, look, look I've got an agreement. And for three months, um, supermarkets sending goods to uh, to their stores in Northern Ireland won't have to have an export health certificate for every single item in the back of the lorry that is a food item. And uh, meat, chilled meat products, the British sausage, can travel into Belfast and Ballymena for six months without being subject to any controls. The problem is the clock ticks. Yep. And what happens after three months? Because if you peer in the back of a supermarket lorry and count the number of separate food items, each of which requires an export health certificate, each of which costs 50 quid, 100 quid. There's a lot of items in the lorry. Um, is that where we're heading? Now, my argument, and I've said this to the European side, is frankly, if someone goes shopping in Belfast or Londonderry, Yes, it's possible that a prawn sandwich or a piece of pizza will end up in the Republic in the boot of a car <laughs> in a fridge because someone's gone shopping over the border. That's what people do. Is this really a threat to the integrity of the single market and food safety standards? No, it isn't. Um, but the Commission has a tendency, and we've seen that repeated in the last few days, to say, well, the rules, the rules. And by the way, you agree to this. So that's the first point. Uh, the second point is the deal was done very late, Christmas Eve. Um, people who've just sent stuff back and forth without ever thinking about a form, yeah. entry, summary declaration, a certificate, a check, a vet, suddenly find a mound of paperwork, cost and bureaucracy. And, and in the middle of a pandemic as well. And, uh, and indeed in the middle yeah. of a pandemic. So uh, we, we learn that seed potatoes, there's a big seed potato industry in Scotland, they can't send their seed potatoes to Northern Ireland. Um, so these are the inevitable consequences of Brexit. And therefore, I, there's a deep irony in seeing people who argued passionately for Brexit, the Prime Minister, the DUP, complaining bitterly about, about the consequences of the policy <laughs> that they argued for like it's just the eu being picky and difficult no the eu will say we're just applying the rules yeah. you knew what the rules were well what, what are you complaining about now having said that the sensitivity of all of this in northern ireland is uh, very considerable and you referred to the graffiti the fact that people have been withdrawn from doing checks uh, tells you how serious this is Exactly. Uh, uh, and shows how sensitive the, the huge gains from the Good Friday uh, of, uh, agreement are. And what we need now is some pragmatism mm. in which I hope the EU will say, all right, for supermarkets, you're a trusted trader. You don't need export health certificates. Um, 
and we, we're going to have to try and address each of these. It may not be possible, but the DUP is arguing that the whole Northern Ireland Protocol should go. But the Northern Ireland Protocol is there to safeguard an open border, because if there's nothing, then eventually the European Court of Justice will say uh, an unauthorized item ended up in Paris. Uh, the reason is Republic of Ireland, because you've left the back door open, mm. namely an unpoliced border, but there cannot be a return to a hard border. So that is what the Joint Committee is now grappling with. And Michael Gove and, and Boris Johnson have seized the opportunity gifted to them by the Commission by their crass, insensitive and utterly stupid decision to invoke uh, Article 16 over vaccine supply, which they reversed within about four hours when they realized how crass, stupid and insensitive it was. Um, it has given the government an opportunity to say, look, we can't, we can't go there. So can we agree a pragmatic way forward? Kind of forgetting that the last people uh, to threaten to blow up the, um, uh, to blow up the uh, withdrawal agreement and the protocol to destroy it was the British government when they brought forward their uh, clauses to the internal market bill, yeah. which was then used as leverage to get the grace periods we've now got, which the government says it wants to extend. I apologise for the length of the answer, but that is the best explanation I can give you of what oh, on earth is going fantastic. on at the moment. Fantastic. And there's lots of people you can read. You should follow Tony Connolly on Twitter from RTE. He is absolutely brilliant um uh both what he says and other people that he uh retweets from who are close observers of what's uh, going on so if you're interested tony connolly i recommend well, um and i'm a, not on a retainer i hasten to point out right on and what's a, next on a slightly um a lighter what? in in relation um to recent polling it suggests that the public believed that Marcus Rashford and Piers Morgan yes. had done a better job at holding the government account to account than Keir Starmer. Um, why do you think that that's occurred? Well, I, I don't necessarily believe that that is the case because Keir Starmer does a fantastic job every week in holding the government to account. And it's a very uncomfortable experience for Boris Johnson. But I suppose if if the newspapers say X is doing a great job and Y is doing not so good a job. Perhaps it's not entirely surprising that the polling comes out in the way that it does. Having said that, yeah. I want to pay enormous tribute. I don't know what Piers D Morgan has done, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but Marcus Rashford, what a guy. What a guy who's in a, um, in many ways, from very difficult circumstances, his upbringing, relying on free school meals. But that's what's motivated him. Exactly. It's his own experience. And although he's a very well-paid footballer now, playing for Man U, uh, he had the courage to stand up and speak out and got enormous public support. And the government realised, oh, bloody hell, we, we, can't, we can't cope with this. We're going to have to do something. Yeah. And it does demonstrate, even when you are not in power, whether you're in the opposition or you're not in frontline politics at all, if you've got a good argument, and you can express it and you can build alliances, you can make governments change their mind. And yeah. that is an encouragement, particularly for oppositions that have uh, lost rather few elections in a row. It doesn't mean that everything is lost. Yeah. yeah. Well, now. Well, yeah, I mean, as, as we are sort of running, running to time. Um, we'll... Yeah, because we, yes, well, I, I'm being reminded that I need to, uh, go in a little while. So, yeah. what of the other questions? I think you had a few more. Yeah, I think. We'll... <laughs> what are the ones are you particularly keen on putting? Uh, we'll go to Batiste, our secretary. Um, okay. Who would like to ask? We want to finish with a couple of light-hearted ones. So okay, fine. Batiste, oh. He wants to just ask um, a couple on his behalf. Okay. Is he unmuted, or do I need to? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was going to ask, being a French citizen, in December I witnessed a lot of French media classifying the deployment of armed UK Navy vessels on the fishing border as, a, as an act of war. And to what, I wanted to know, to what extent do you agree with this classification? And do you believe that the debate around the fishing border is more ideological than economical? Well, it, look, I think it was a negotiating tactic on behalf of the UK government. 
The thing about fisheries is that it was one thing in the negotiations that the UK had that the EU wanted. And so the UK was always going to leave fisheries to last, to lever things that the UK wanted in advance of turning attention to, OK, what are we going to do about uh, fisheries? That's the first point. The second point is that um, it's fisheries very difficult for President Macron and others because, you know, cross fishermen get very cross. <laughs> Uh, if their livelihoods are affected. Mm -hmm. And we, we've seen that with the Scottish fishermen who've discovered to their horror that being able to sell their sh shellfish to, to Europe has now become very, very difficult because of the Brexit that many of them voted for. Um, sure. But I have sympathy for them because they've been led up the garden path. Most certainly. And they have been led up the garden path. And there was a very poignant interview on LBC yesterday or today with one of the fishing organization leaders in which basically uh, he sounded very very downbeat as he was coming to terms with what actually brexit means for their for their members um a compromise was reached what's interesting about it is what happens in five and a half years time because the way the agreement is structured if the european side isn't happy with what's offered then then not only uh, does it affect the future of fisheries, but other bits of the agreement may be called into question, in particular, tariff-free trade. So I think the EU has negotiated quite cleverly to put those other uh, connections into the agreement. There will be a very strong incentive on both sides to reach an agreement in five and a half years' time about what we're going to do then. And I suppose what happens in the intervening time does, is the British fishing industry going to grow to take advantage of some of the additional the additional access it's got? What happens to the European um, uh, fishing fleet? But it would have been a very bad reflection on the whole process if we'd ended up with a repeat of the uh, Icelandic Cod War that I am old enough to remember when boats were ramming each other in the North Atlantic. I mean, uh, oh, well, you know, well, thank you so much for that. And I think the last question from us. I know that um, yeah. we've had a couple of questions from okay. members but the last question from us is sort of just a sort of fun one is next week we have a we have ex-liberal mp deputy leader of the house um tom brake on the call would you support his calls for like constitutional reform do you do you would you commend what he's doing do you think it's kind of pushing for you were talking about devolution earlier is it pushing in the right direction and what would you ask him well i'm a, i'm in favor of um electing the House of Commons by the alternative vote system, I'm in favour of an elected second chamber by proportional representation. There you are. Because I don't think there's a perfect electoral system. The strength of first past the post is the constituency link for members. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm uneasy about proportionate floating top-up MPs who don't represent an area because yeah. uh, representing a constituency definitely keeps you grounded as an MP and when I sat around the cabinet table and we discussed matters, uh, members of the cabinet commented based on their constituency experience. And I think it's very easy yeah. in other systems where you become a minister, you don't, you cease to be an elected representative, you can quickly become divorced um, from what goes on. Because if you're discussing benefit policy, if it's not working, your surgeries on a Friday and a Saturday will tell you very quickly very it's not clear. working. Yeah. Mm. So it's accountability. Um, I, secondly, I would have more devolution in uh, England. I am not, I, I'm opposed to Scottish uh, independence uh, because I think uh, Scotland has a very large degree of power um, and rightly, but I think Scotland also benefits from being part of the whole, namely the United Kingdom, as the vaccine rollout demonstrates. Yeah, most certainly. Frankly. So, um, but do, uh, give my best to Tom oh, when well, you talk to him, okay? Um, yeah. um, in, in regards, of course, your father was a very renowned politician. Um, do you think um, he would be, in, uh, was he um, proud of, about the side of the Labour Party you've aligned with? Well, he, look, he had his own views, you know, I, he uh, was, uh, he said he was, a, he was a great European, but he didn't like the European Union. 
Yeah. And and he he you know he that remained his his view uh, for the whole of his life. Uh, he was part of the socialist campaign group. Uh, he was, but it's an ex, it's an exemplar of the broadness of the Labour Church. And I want us to be a broad church. Always, always going forward as well. Yeah, definitely. And that means respecting that other people in the Labour Party may have a different view to you. It doesn't make them a traitor. It doesn't make them a red Tory. And uh, one or two other things that some of us have been called by other members of the <laughs> Labour Party, which um, I find quite distressing. I can, uh, really. I Ar you know, have the argument about the issue. Debate the subject, the merits of the policy. You know, don't kick the man or the woman. I, I've been called a bleeding heart Tory before. Have um, you? Yeah, <laughs> many times. And I've been called a, um, I've been called a Blairite and sort of all the sort of manner well, of There we are. Like well, the thing about labels, and it's an important thing in life, uh, labels are often a way of avoiding listening yeah. to the argument of the person putting it. Because you can just say, oh, they're just a Blairite, they're just a Thatcherite. Yeah. And listen to the argument. I remember bumping into Teddy Taylor, the he was a right wing conservative MP, I think, by his own admission in the division lobby when we were voting to ban fox hunting. And I said, Teddy, I'm, I'm very surprised to see you in here. Because I they were, I'd made an assumption. Tory on the right must be in favour of fox hunting. He said, Hillary, I'd never really thought about it. I was invited to a local hunt. It was the most disgusting thing I ever witnessed. And from that moment on, I resolved if I got the chance to vote to ban it, I would. And we walked oh. through the division lobby together. So it's an important lesson in life. Yeah. Well, now, have you, did you say there were just a couple of other quick ones before no, I have to I, go? I'll go? First yeah. of all, Yassin, I know that he's got a question, and then to Baron, and um, yeah. I don't know. Um, um, yes. um, hi again, sir. So just wanted to ask a question um, based on my background in geography. On yeah. your appointment as um, environment, food, and rural affairs, and your handling of the bovine tuberculosis epidemic. Uh -huh. um, just wanted to know more about your your decisions and your handling, and, and your justi justification behind those decisions. What what fueled them? Well, very simply, I arrived in the department, and on my desk was the report of the scientific advisory group, which, contrary to many people's expectations, said. Um, culling badgers cannot meaningfully contribute to the control of bovine tuberculosis. Mm. Now, the farmers were very, very unhappy about that uh, because bovine TB is a terrible disease. They lose a lot of cattle um, and they saw killing badgers as a way of controlling the spread of the disease. Um, I, I didn't. And I got up and announced that in the House of Commons and the farm, the farmers were very, very angry with me. Let's just be frank. Uh, and then there was a change of government. Culling came in. Actually, recently, George Eustace has announced that um, the government is going to not issue any more culling licenses. I mean, the answer is um, vaccination. But the reason the farming industry didn't want vaccination of cattle was because you couldn't then export your cattle to the EU or elsewhere because at the time, the EU would say, well, how do I know that this uh, cow, um, which is showing positive, is positive because it's got TB or because it's been vaccinated? And so there was a lot of work to develop what's known as a DIVA test to differentiate an infected from a vaccinated animal, DIVA, D-I-V-A. Um, and a lot of work has also been done to try and, well, you can inject badgers, but it's very time consuming to catch them. Um, I visited the scientists at Weybridge who were trying to develop a vaccine that would be surrounded in food that only badgers would like to eat. So you could drop it outside their sets and they would gobble it up and they were trying different um, basically recipes as to what was going to work. And there will now be a move towards vaccination of cattle. Um, so uh, there were economic reasons against doing what you might have thought was sensible in the first place, which was to vaccinate. That's a very short answer to a long and complex story, but thanks for asking. Oh, brilliant. Well, I think actually, by the looks of things, that is it. Because you That's know, it. All right. So, do you know, it's been an absolute. Oh, is it? Well, Luke had one question. Oh, did Luke? Yeah, if he's still on the call. If Luke's. Is Luke there? Oh, yeah. He's yeah. He's, uh, <laughs> apologies to <laughs> Sorry, Luke. <laughs> 
Hiya. Um, Hi. So I was just wanted to ask about the new Leeds Bradford Airport development. Yes. That I think today was given the green light. And also with uh, the third runway at Heathrow now being, now they're allowed to apply for that. Will there be a strong commitment of the Labour Party with obviously their new green initiatives to stand against the third runway at Heathrow with all that in mind? Well, we um, we had a vote in the House of Commons and I think different M Labour MPs voted different ways. But I should just say to you, when I was the Environment Secretary, I argued in Cabinet and with Gordon Brown against giving the third runway the go-ahead and I was in a minority. Yeah. And I voted against the third runway going ahead in the House of Commons when we had the vote a year and a half ago or so. Given what coronavirus has done to air travel, um, I'm not sure that it is going to be built, certainly not anytime soon. And the challenge for air travel is very simple. If a way of propelling lots of people in a tin tube up into the sky can be found that doesn't emit CO2, well, then we're in business. Yeah. But that's not the case. Air travel is the most difficult part of our current um, CO2 emissions to decarbonize. And as it so happens, I wrote again today objecting to the uh, the new buildings, but also the expanded capacity at Leeds Bradford Airport for the same reason, because we've got a climate emergency. We've got our work cut out to reduce the emissions we're producing at the moment. We really shouldn't be adding to them until we can find a way of making them zero emissions. So a very timely question, if I may say so. <laughs> Luke. Thank you. All right. I think that's just now I am I'm literally going to have to go because I'm you. in trouble. But can I say it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. And I wish all of you every success Thank you. in the months and the years ahead. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Bye.